Greetings to you all. This is Dr. Tsepo Mvulane Muloy, and I am talking to you from Naledi in Soweto, South Africa. Now, we are sitting in a setup where I have temporarily um, created a mini space of a library where I am using it as my resource as I write um, my various articles and books. Um, basically, I am thinking quite seriously about everything Africa. So from African history, African philosophy, and particularly because we're in South Africa and we are so-called South Africans, I'm actually thinking deeply about the question of the identity of being a South African. What does it mean? Where does it come from? Um, what's the implications involved? And everything in that light. So even when I engage um, within the theme of decolonizing the curriculum, within the of decolonizing knowledge, I am thinking about it from the context of where I am, which the literature refers to as the locus of enunciation. Meaning, everything that you can engage, you have to engage it from your positionality, from your lived experience, which again, the jargon of the literature refers to as ontological reality okay so that's basically where i am and um the idea now is to just take you through some of these sources just to give you an overview um of my of of my material so that um we could be at home going forward in the conversation so um the first two sections here are basically on african philosophy and what I'm interested in finding out here is firstly, who are the so-called African philosophers? What have they been grappling with in this phenomena called African philosophy? And what exactly is African about philosophy? Because we know that philosophy is a Western discourse, right? Um, so I go right from, at least I try to deal with authoritative voices, um, and then, and then come to wherever I can, come to um, the voices of the scholars that I get from South Africa. Interestingly for me, Anton Lambert, people, for whatever reason, forget that besides the fact that he's the first president of the ANC Youth League, he is actually the first black South African to write a master's dissertation in philosophy, which by default then makes him one of our contemporary black South African philosophers. But if you listen to the rhetoric around him, people are not engaging him as a black South African philosopher. They're engaging him as the first black president of the ANC Youth League, which really reduces his intellect and his contribution to the body of work of, of African philosophy. Um, <clears throat> right, so I go on and you'll see there's Fanon, there's um, Marcus Garvey, um, you know, so the range goes, but my main interest as I go into this scholarship of African philosophy is trying to see if I can actually qualify Professor Eskia Mpashela as one of our South African philosophers. He, has ne he is, although he's referred to here and there, within philosophy contexts because of his African humanism. But there is no thoroughgoing text that says he is an South African philosopher. And that is basically what I'm looking to, to write about in my, in my book. Right, and then, and so most of the sources then here are to do with the Skiam Pachela, me in investigating with that in mind, him as a prospective person to be considered um, as an African philosopher. Then, um, as we go, above me uh, would be two, two sections on black South African women. Um, you can call them scholars, you can call them writers, you can call it because, you know, they range. Um, and, it, and it, you know, my, my reference really begins with Noni Jabavu. An interesting fact about Noni Jabavu is that... Um, Besides the fact that she's a daughter, granddaughter, to the great uh, DDT Jabavu, um, 
we are in Soweto. So there's a section in Soweto called Jabav. That basically is the same family that she comes from. But what people don't know, what a lot of people don't know, is that she um, is born in the same year and dies in the same year as a ski and patrol. So I find these things to be very interesting because a lot of people can talk about Iskia Mpashela, a lot of people can talk about Nani Jabav, but they were in the same lifespan. Which, if we are to listen to feminism rhetoric, or these concerns about uh, black women not being recognized, I think this, just contrasting these two, will speak volumes to that argument. Right, and then, um, you know, she, she of course is really, really, really related to Bessie, in terms of the time frame of uh, our early women, black women writers, followed very close with Bessie Head, uh, who we know now uh, passes away in exile, um, very poor. Um, a lot of people that are talking about Bessie Head, you know, actually think she's from Botswana, and yet Bessie Head is really from, you know, back in the day they would call them bastards if she was in Namibia. Later in South Africa, we take the jargon of Kalets. Um, so she was really born of a white mother and a, uh, a black father. Um, and, and the father never really, because the father was actually the one who was working for the mother. And she was a wealthy white woman um, who died very early when Bessie was still very young. So she, she goes on to live a very, 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 very um, poor life, you know, but she makes her name in, in literature. Um, not celebrated in her lifetime, but at least that has been corrected over the years, right? Um, we can go on and on about our black women scholars, but what I want to say is it's an insult that it's only when a young lady called Mpochi Vase in as late as 2018 graduates for her PhD in philosophy and we are told that she's the black She's the first black South African philosopher, woman philosopher. Of course, because of race, we can question this black in inverted commas, because before her was an Indian woman who graduated in philosophy, but nobody speaks about that woman. Everyone is jumping on Mpo because Mpo is like, is like me and the majority of the people in this country, so they're beginning conveniently to say she's the the first black. So if we go with the black of Steve Biko, which includes Indians and colors, then she will not meet that criteria. But if we go with just the, uh, the problematic, usual, colloquial black, then she would be the first. Right, so, so anyway, that was just in passing. And then um, I have an entire section on the ANC, from its origins to up to date, it's uh, how it began and how it developed. And, what, and, and what's worth saying with regards to the ANC is that the biggest problem with the ANC, um, which a lot of analysts omit, is the fact that most of their staff, because they call themselves a broad church, most of their staff is really borrowed. It's not original from the very um, polit politicians that are part of, you know, the ANC. So... A particular example here is a document they use as part of their deployment policy. And that document they call the, the, the eye of the needle. Um, and this document is interesting because it is used as a formula to determine which of the cadres qualify to be appointed into government positions and the like. Yet, if you do your research, this is a document which they take from a white, a young white liberal who was assassinated um, by the name of Rick Turner. And Rick Turner, interestingly, was very close to Steve Biko, which also then begs the question, did some of Biko's thoughts, were they also influenced by Rick Turner? And we obviously have to think, because I have an entire... The archive just below me here is on Sobukwe and Steve Biko, and I put Pego in there um, 
and uh, and Gandhi. I put that section on its own because when I think about Eskiam Pashela's African humanism and the people I've just mentioned now, Biko, Subukwe, Gandhi, um, this question of Ubuntu, this question of humanity, they speak in volumes. Their body of scholarship speaks volumes to that. Of course, if we go with this rainbow nationism of Desmond Tutu, and which obviously was thoroughly adopted by Nelson Mandela's government, we then would have to talk to also the books that I have towards the end there on Desmond Tutu's um, <coughs> forgive, you know, forgiveness and the like. Right. And then um, I have a section on our South African scholars, uh, our South African authors, uh, beginning with Saul Platke, who we are told is the first to write a novel in South Africa uh, as a black South African. This is really, really amnesia because before Platke, perhaps the blacks that did write were not recognized in this way that from Platke on. Um, but there's a book by uh, Jeff Opland, which I have on my shelf. Um, and he really gives us the history of black people in South Africa writing. And it is shocking that the, the, the so-called Eastern Cape today, um, this is the first space within the South African context. And I say South African in inverted commas because before South Africa, and South Africa is really something that comes up only from 1910 on. So pre-1910, you know, it becomes ridiculous to think that not a single black South, South African, meaning pre the name South African, right, did not write. So we have a responsibility to go and dig the archive and actually unearth and excavate pre saw Platky black South African writers. And this work, I've just told you the book is by Jeff Opland. This is an insult because he is not only not a South African, but this is a white Scottish man who is an authority on our black archive. So this speaks volumes. I mean, now with Fismas 4, we're busy decolonize the curriculum. We want to see ourselves in the information and the knowledge and the scholarship. But the people who have done this work, um, interestingly, using our, our presses. So the book that I'm referring to is by KZN, University of Guazulu Natal Press. And you're like, but this is crazy. I mean, where are our own scholars? It raises a big question about what have so-called black South African professors, what exactly have they been working on? Precisely post-94, you know, because pre-94 we will hear a barrage of excuses, but post-94, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the question of who are the, how many black South African historians can we name? Historians. Because all the, all the body of knowledge we can talk to, its bedrock, its gist, its premise must be on history. So if the history has been, on, has been whitewashed, if the history has been Eurocentric, if the history has been with what decolonial literature says is the white gaze, and here we think of Fanon, the Eurocentric gaze, then it begs the question of what the hell are we using that as our references? Because it then means that we are lazy to actually interrogate that kind of archive. And so we need to pay more attention on who are our black historians. And here we blow the definition of a historian apart. It is not the people looking for chronological dates as when we started what. If we actually look at African literature, the guys I'm talking about, from Saul Platke on, right up to Mpashela, right up to today, to the new ones, uh, Nick Mklongo. If we look at what is referred to as African fiction, we will be shocked at how much of it is actually our reality. And remember, I said lived reality, which is ontological experience. Is that not a form of history? 
But because this definition that has been given to us by the colonizers is such that it refers to a historian as someone who is actually doing archiving, doing dates, chronology. We therefore do not read these texts as historical texts or texts that talk to history, which tells us that even the way we acknowledge our own authors is informed from a Eurocentric premise. Therefore, we interpret from a Eurocentric uh, tradition, which, which really makes us really divorce ourselves. We are not who we're supposed to be. Okay, so moving on very quickly. And then I've got an entire uh, section on apartheid, pre-apartheid and pre-apartheid, apartheid and post-apartheid. Because I'm fascinated by um, what fervurt uh, terms as good for black people or the so-called Bantu and what we would perceive to be not good and against, against that kind of you know, that kind of indoctrination and propaganda. Um, so yeah, so there's much to be said about that. But it needs to be said here that um, the very notion of apartheid, people think that Fervurt got it from his fellow Afrikaner community. And it is not true. Fervurt actually gets this concept from the, pro the most progressive, so-called progressive nation in the world. He got it in America, right? And we don't hear much of that being repeated whenever Fervurt is brought up. And there's a fascinating book here, um, which this author, this author writes on the man who killed apartheid. Okay? And he's referring to Fervurt. And, I mean, he's referring to Dimitris Safendis. This is the guy who knifed Fervurt to, to murder him. Now, what is interesting in this book is we are told that Safendis was mad. Um, what he did was because he was from, uh, he was coming from, um, you know, what do they call these things? Not a, a, an asylum. And so if he was thinking straight, he was never going to do that. But what this author does in this book, and he does it thoroughly, he proves how Safendis' act, final act to actually assassinate Verwurt was over a period of years right so so it is a pity we don't actually go into such depth when we talk about apartheid and the architect of apartheid um but um another interesting thing that i just want to say in passing because we don't have the space to, to discuss at length is that we need to hear more statements such as fervurt was a brilliant mind we might not want to hear that but if we go into his cv we will be shocked fervurt was the number one in his province in metric fervurt goes to stellenbosch and he goes on to become the four what would be the president of the src fervurt got what i got in 2006 he got awarded the sir abe bailey scholarship and he rejected it. What is the Sir A. Bailey Scholarship? It is a scholarship that rewards the best student in the university, and the only one to one, who's excellent in academics, excellent in leadership, and excellent in sports. Fervurt got it, and he rejected it. Now we need to talk to why, and it is fascinating that he argued that he could not take the luxury of that scholarship because in their time, different to my time, is that you would go overseas by ship for six months, right? Things have changed now, we use planes. So we, we only go for about a month or so, right? We leave after exams, the last exams at the end of the year, we come back before Christmas. They, in their time, because of technology, uh, they took up to six months, right? Because they went by ship. He says he couldn't afford that much time to take this, this scholarship up because he was working on this project that would become eventually known to us as apartheid. So we don't hear enough of these things, right? And again, we don't hear enough that Fervurt was a social engineer, meaning apartheid wasn't some 
political concept he just cooked up. He used his academic training to apply his thoughts on this complicated... Of course, we can reduce it to the court case that he referred to in America, you know, but he used... That court case was just the icing on the cake. He used his background, right, of, so, of psychology um, to actually... Because really, apartheid is really a psychological... Um, phenomena so which is why to this day we still argue when post apartheid um there's a colleague now who's now with university of free state you are going to hear we are now talking in december 2020 you are going to hear from january 2021 there is going to be an introduction of what is called apartheid studies it's going to be uh, um the idea is it's going to be a degree it's going to be available at honors masters and phd um, fascinating about this colleague is that he's not black South African. So I am always interested in what happens to black South Africans when other people are always running, right, with what you would think should preoccupy us, right? But anyway, then moving on very quickly, the rest of the sections I have beyond the ANC is on basically the phenomena of education and scholarship, intellectual intellectualism in South Africa. Um, so I go from indigenous knowledge systems right up to what the literature is now referring to as fees must fall. Um, and so I'm interested there in, you know, what are people saying and how they're thinking, what are their ideas around decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing scholarship, decolonizing knowledge. Um, and then I wrap it up with, um, with, remember I studied with African philosophy, I wrap it up with western philosophy and you can tell the juxtaposition i've done where my african philosophy is closest to me and my western philosophy is the farthest from me uh, because it then puts the picture in my mind of how i actually want to engage the scholarship that i've set up together so that's that in a nutshell um, that's how i set up my workshop